The Ascent is the big SUV from Subaru and it comes with some big selling points without too strong of drawbacks. It was also refreshed for 2023. So today I'm going to go over the highs, the lows, and all of the new changes. The most apparent alteration for 2023 is going to be the front fascia with a little tweaking around back as well. Thankfully, the prices of these have remained very reasonable. And we actually add a new trim for 23. That is the Onyx Limited, which takes the nicer features of the top trims and combines it with the darker aesthetic and rugged seats of the Onyx. Standard on the Onyx Limited and Touring is a new 360 view camera. All Ascents will also be granted a larger infotainment screen. Sitting at a menacing 11.6 inches, it will also come with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Each Ascent will also get the new wide angle camera in the EyeSight Active Safety Suite that's going to improve accuracy and help it see the road better, especially through intersections. And the last new feature is a Cabin Connect, which uses a microphone up front to amplify your voice to the third row passengers. It also makes you sound like an airplane pilot. The next stop is your mom's house. Those are all the changes for 2023. And if you enjoy fun, detailed car content without fluff, consider subscribing and hitting the bell for notifications. While these are in no particular order, one big pro to the Subaru Ascent, in my opinion, is the comfort. While I wouldn't label it as the most plush three-row crossover you could imagine, it does ride very nicely over some of the harshest roads I could take it over. It's forgiving and smooth. And outside of some wind noise, it's quiet at highway velocities. Plus, if you get the limited or touring, you will have adjustable thigh support for the driver's seat, which really helps me at six foot three. The seats themselves are kind of bolstered nicely. The leather is soft. I think the Outback has a little bit more plush and cozy seats, but it's definitely one of the better that I've felt in this segment. And the second row also features cushy seats with decent bolstering. But what makes it more impressive is not only the comfort that you have in the second row, it's also the support that you have in the third row. And even again at my height, the amount of headroom in there isn't punishing. Yes, the legroom is compromised and you would have to delegate space to be comfortable if you're, you know, maybe over like 5'8 or so. But the fact that you can fit someone my size in each row while retaining dignity is commendable, just not best in class. Briefly, I'd like to thank Royal on the East Side in Bloomington, Indiana for letting me test drive an ascent to make this video possible. The staff are friendly and knowledgeable and all of their new cars come without a markup. If you're looking for a new ride, check them out. But if you stray off the highway to some back roads, one thing that you'll notice really quick is my next pro and that is the handling. So just like other Subarus, this has a boxer engine. To be specific, it's a 2.4 liter twin scroll turbocharged unit making 260 horsepower, 277 pound feet of torque. Nothing special there, but that helps this reduce its center of gravity. That means despite this not being sprung super stiff, it can still go around corners with good levels of body control. Yes, it is not flat. You will feel some body motion there, especially around higher speeds, but compared to the other competitors I've driven in the class, this feels very glued down to the road. The steering is also very light. It's numb and a little vague on center, but it also changes direction surprisingly quick. The steering itself feels very precise. And on top of that, just like pretty much every other Subaru, this has great visibility. So overall, on pretty much every road, it's capable, just not Fun. And my next reason ties into confidence, and that's going to be the all-wheel drive system. But before I get into the drivetrain, let's talk about the powertrain just a little bit. While I wouldn't consider it an advantage over the class, this thing can pull off a zero to 60 in under seven seconds. As is typical with the CVT, there's a slight delay there in off-the-line acceleration, and despite there being a little noticeable lag, the Ascent still manages to kick down in a timely manner without ever lugging the engine. I find it to be more refined than what you'll find in something like a Toyota Highlander, but also not as linear and natural. And unlike the Toyota, this tows only 2,000 pounds in the base spec. All other trims get a trans cooler, allowing it to pull 5,000. Now hooked up to that is Subaru's full-time symmetrical all-wheel drive. It's the active system, so it's going to constantly adjust the torque split front and rear through a wet clutch pack in the center. It can divert well over 50% of power to the rear axle. All of these will come standard with Subaru's X mode, which uses the brakes to help shift power from side to side to help you get unstuck. They also have a more aggressive two-mode version that comes standard on the Onyx Edition and up. 
This offers great control, instantaneous traction, but not a lot of off-road prowess just because its approach, breakover, and departure angles are not great. Though this does have 8.7 inches of ground clearance, helping it clear small obstacles. And the last main reason that I would pick up a Subaru Ascent is going to be the substance for money. So as I mentioned, this handles very well for the class and it's comfortable, making it feel kind of expensive on the road when you get past the really light steering. You also have good features like standard LED steering responsive headlights, tri-zone automatic climate control, that big touchscreen with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, four USB ports and like 86 cup holders. And as you step up each trim, you get a nice bump in amenities or luxurious touches. Like with the premium trim, you get a leather wrapped steering wheel, shifter, heated seats, a HVAC control unit for the back, and the available of other features that become standard on the Onyx, like the power rear gate, the proximity unlock and lock. I also enjoy the faux leather StarTech seating that's supposed to be a little bit more durable than the leather seating that you'll find on the Limited or Touring. Something I think families will appreciate, and there's plenty of other features I'm leaving out. The value here is strong considering the amenities, standard all-wheel drive, and confident handling. Really, this deserves one more round of applause for the family-oriented details. So that's my next reason. You have things like that StarTech upholstery, but also the standard dad mirror, the cabin connect on high trims, the wide opening rear doors that have a lot of resistance, making it harder for kids to smack the sole out of a neighboring vehicle or pole. Then there's design touches like the vertical C-pillar, making it easy to get into the third row, and once you're back there, you're not punished, and can even get a few charging ports. Cabin lighting is also good, most have AC controls in the back, second row sunshades are standard or can be accessorized on each trim, plus you have 19 cup holders with great storage all around. It's not just a bigger Outback, it's a more thoughtful one. And that concludes the pros to the Subaru Ascent. But something I really want to talk about is also reliability. So it was kind of rocky there for the first couple of years for the body style that was introduced in 2019. I think the biggest issue was related to the powertrain control module that actually was allowing the CVT chain to slip, leading to transmission replacements and complaints. For the most part, this engine doesn't seem to be the source of any consistent problems. While the 2.4 liter is fairly new, the FA20 engine was used in the WR Rex from 2015 to 2021 and was pretty reliable there. So I'm optimistic about the FA24 outside of select reports of fuel mixing into the oil that mysteriously goes away after a while. Many people also had issues with the fuel pump that warranted a recall. Fewer people also saw a recall on the AC refrigerant line too. In addition, some reported power steering problems and and buggy software. The issues that were reported more often for this generation came from a power sucking tailgate, weak stock batteries, and easily cracking windshields. While I know I went over a lot of issues there, most of these have already been tackled and aren't super widespread. Still, I'd like to give it a few more years before I would label reliability as a pro, but this does have very good resale value, which should keep your overall running cost pretty low. Though when we're considering running costs, that involves my first drawback, and that would be gas mileage. It lands on the lower side of the segment at about 21 combined. Additionally, while I think that the interior space is good enough for this kind of vehicle, it would be nice if the floor in the second row was a little lower to improve thigh support to make the seats even more comfortable. And the same goes with the cargo area. It's still good, but just very middle of the road for the segment and the exterior size of this thing, which is a trade-off I think I can accept given the good insulation. I'm also not impressed by the infotainment system, which has a slow response time for 2023 and just okay resolution. It is simply laid out, and I do like that the HVAC has plenty of controls constantly Constantly available, however, I'd still prefer those to be all physical. While the system is well integrated into the dash, I wish they'd give it a better UI and higher quality screen if they're going to make it such a prominent piece of the cabin. This all makes me appreciate the more analog approach to the gauge cluster. But at the very least, we need to give credit for them keeping the temperature control and the volume and tune dial. The middling infotainment system also draws light to the kind of dated feel of the cabin, which is further hampered by less than ideal material choice and panel fitment. But I think the drawbacks I've highlighted are things that are usual 
in the Subaru lineup, hold for the gas mileage. And the pros to buying this are also very similar to other Subarus. And that kind of helps me understand the biggest appeal to the Subaru Ascent, and that is the basic fact that it is also a Subaru, except it's big and focused around families first. Which I think is a very important niche that this car nicely fills. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please leave a like to help me make a fool of the YouTube algorithm. If you want to see more, consider subscribing and hitting the bell for notifications. And thank you to my loyal patrons. I'll catch you in the next one.